Welcome everyone to the Sussex Humanities Lab um, inaugural annual lecture. It's great to see so many people here in person, which is a testament to the real reason why we are all here today, to celebrate our friend, our colleague, our mentor, Professor Tim Hitchcock. Um, I am Sharon Webb. I'm one of the directors of the Sussex Humanities Lab, and I will say a few words of introduction to the lab and in, indeed introduce um, our speaker, Tim. But before I do so, I just want to hand over to Ian McDaniel, um, who is joint head of the History Department, to say a few words of welcome. <clears throat> Thanks, Sharon. I, I won't say too much, but I just want to say a couple of things on behalf of my role as co-head of the History Department, and just to give you a bit of a sense of Tim's contribution to history over, I think, nine years, we, we started pretty much at the same time. Um, so where to start? Um, maybe to say we know there is no way that history would have done as well as it did in the recent ref without Tim's contribution, not just in terms of his, his research, but also in terms of his mentorship and also his impact case study, the digital panopticon, which itself I think is testament to the years of research, collaboration and hard work, sheer hard work, which went in to that project. I also want to convey thanks from the many junior and senior colleagues from across the department who have benefited from Tim's mentorship in reworking their grant applications and in their own writing projects. Thanks also for your insistence, Tim, on building a digital skills component into the history degree, something which Sharon and James Baker took forward to such effects which and which has now become I think one of the distinctive features of what it means to study history at this university. Uh, more personally for myself thanks for being one of the few colleagues still committed to teaching 18th century history. Um, I'm thinking actually of your Gordon Riots module which I once had the pleasure of sample marking uh, so thanks for that. And one final thing, thanks for being super competent. Um, <laughs> not just competent, but super competent. This phrase always sticks in my mind as a phrase that a former professorial colleague used when talking about Tim. And I think it's very appropriate. And so I'm just gonna close there. Thanks for being a super competent colleague. <laughs> Thanks, Ian. Um, so, as I mentioned, this is the first public lecture organised by the Sussex Humanities Lab, and it was devised as a way to acknowledge and celebrate individuals whose scholarship, research and work closely re relates to, and in this case is central to, the lab's mission statement, ethos and values. Since its foundation in 2014, the lab has developed a unique intellectual agenda and framework and continues to grow and expand beyond, beyond its original conception. We describe ourselves as a Digital Humanities Plus lab, one which centres research and work around applying and critiquing digital methods, tools and analysis in a variety of contexts, disciplines and domains. As our current tagline states, the Society Humanities Lab investigates the interactions between computational technology, culture, society and environment. We describe the lab as a community rather than a lab of technology or tech. We prioritise collaboration and foster inter and transdisciplinary work and have a portfolio of past and present projects that are testament to this, to this ethos, many of which Tim has led or has instigated or has indeed supported. The current trajectory of the lab as a space of experimentation, as a space that is concerned with, as we all should be, climate change and climate action as a space that is feminist, queer and inclusive, that is critical and applied, that is fun as well as serious, is because of the way in which Tim, as well as other founding directors of the lab, including Caroline Bassett, Rachel Thompson, David Berry, uh, Sally J. Norman, David Weir, supported and encouraged the lab's community. The current team of the directors, that is um, Alice, Ben and I, are especially thankful to Tim's ongoing mentorship. Indeed, we are all thankful of Tim's directorship during 2019, 2021, especially during round after round of lockdowns. I think we would all agree that Tim's collegiality and care for their communities have had a profound and positive impact. In this room, Tim does not need an introduction, but I will attempt to provide one anyway. Not only because we want to celebrate their work and their vast important contributions to scholarship and developments across history, digital history and digital humanities, 
but also because you want to acknowledge the imp impact on the research environment and not in the ref sense. They have fostered and cultivated a Sussex during their ongoing work and contributions to the lab, to history, to the school and to the wider university in higher education. Tim is an internationally renowned scholar of digital history and of 18th century histories of gender, sexuality and poverty, and has combined these research areas to develop new and innovative research that situates and prioritises histories from below to histories from below that are accessible through digital means. They were appointed Professor of History at the University of Sussex in 2013 and served as co-director of the lab from 2014 and director from 2019 to 2021. Tim's pro uh, work on projects such as The Old Bailey, London Lives, Locating London's Past, Connected History, The Digital Panopticon, BBC Connected Histories, exemplify the way in which Tim's research and practice is innovative in practical terms as well as intellectually. Tim's innovations in digital history are also innovations in history more broadly. Their work is more than mere digitization and access, a feat in and of itself when you consider their work on these various digital resources help uh, give direct access to around 40 billion words of digital uh, of primary source evidence. But instead, um, it's framed around, uh, sorry, instead it's uh, framed thoroughly and situated within and across historiograph her historiographical rigor, transparency and evidence, method and practice are key drivers in Tim's work as is attending to audience outside of the academy. And while speaking of transparency and openness, I know Tim would want me to acknowledge the project teams um, and team members in these, in these endeavors, most notably Bob Shoemaker, Sharon Howard, Ben Jackson, and Louise Falcini, to name but a few. Tim's endeavors and scholarship is one but one facet of a multifaceted coin. Their teaching methods and style should also be acknowledged. I have read feedback forms from first year students which simply read, more Tim Hitchcock next year, please. <laughs> in other contributions to the wider research environment, Tim was a founding member of the AHRC Advisory Board and Peer Review College, and is a member and past chair of the AHRC's Digital Transformations Group. Yeah, he was also a member of the British Library's Advisory Council from 2013 to 2020. As many of you know, Tim is also an expert wood turner and craftsman, and many of us here have benefited from receiving beautifully handcrafted wooden fruit bowls or two. Um, and this expertise was also noted in a 2019 Senate report, which stated Tim Hitchcock with Ahmed Coins and uh, Ben Jackson have begun a program of identifying original band sp uh, Basil Spence furniture still on site and ensuring that this furniture is being maintained in a usable condition. They are seeking to repair British higher education one Basil, Basil Spence chair at a time. And thank you to Ahmed for forwarding this quote for inclusion here today. But in going backward to look forward, Tim's degree was from the University of California at Berkeley in 1980. And their undergraduate supervisor, Tom LeCure, um, Professor Emeritus, Department of History in UC, uh, UC Berkeley, wanted to share some memories and thoughts. So this is from Tom. I met Ta uh, Tim Hitchcock 45 years ago. He was my student as an undergraduate. And the historian Tim Hitchcock, whom you know, was recognizable in the Berkeley student I knew in the early 19 1980s. His raw talent was manifest. He wrote one of the most wonderful, genuinely brilliant honors uh, thesis that I have supervised in over five decades of teaching. More to the point, you would recognize a quality of mind, the ability to approach historical questions in their granular particularity. The question he asked in his thesis had to do with the origins of extra uh, parochial workhouses and administrative jurisdictions. Rather than looking for an answer in high politics or bureaucratic infighting or ideology, Tim decided to map their locations. That is to ask what one might learn from a study of where they are located, historical geography. He discovered that they were built along well-traveled roads and should be understood as a response to the increased mobility of the poor with which the parochial system could not cope. I tell you this because it speaks to the relationship between Tim Hitchcock, the historian, and Tim Hitchcock, the pioneer of digital humanities, and the builder of some of the most important data collections in the world. In the first place, his earliest works um, is beginning of his lifelong interest in the way society treats its poor and in the lives of ordinary people. The Old Bailey and London Lives and other projects of, um, of his make them visible and more generally speaks to the fact that digital humanities exist to address historical and more generally humanistic questions. 
There were no Digimontes when Tim was an undergraduate, no web, no internet to speak of. But before all this technology, the young Tim Hitchcock possessed a sort of Borgesian hunger. He decided to read everything held by the British Library published. I think it was 17, 18, uh, 17 13? 17, yeah. Uh, my sense is that uh, he helped create Digimandis as a way to, uh, as, as well as many important databases in order to slack that hunger, to connect everything with everything at a granular level from the ground up. Finally, let me say how much I admire Tim's ability to translate foundational, almost instinctual intellectual interests into reality. Very few historians have been as good as he at building teams, gaining financial support, and bringing big projects to fruition. I would not say that I saw all this coming in 20-year-old Hitchcock, but I'm not surprised by his success. And I'm quite sure that his retirement will have little to no effect on his creativity and his productivity. I am proud to say I was there in the beginning and happy that I can wish him well for the next stage in a remarkable career. So on that note, I will hand over to Tim for their paper on the worlds of the dead reimagined, close reading, humanistic understands and the challenge of data science. I don't know. I'm going to have to get five minutes out of the, um, out of the talk. But thank you very much. That was really wonderful. And I am deeply touched. Um, and thank you all for coming. Um, and I'm afraid this, this talk is, um, I can put it, it sits awkwardly between various stools, um, both because it is in part about history. Of course, it's about history. It's also about digital humanities. I look around the room, and of course, I see a bunch of historians, and I see a bunch of digital humanists, and I think I'm going to get it wrong for each and every one of you. Um, but with that in mind, I'm just going to get on with it. Um, this is the first, as, as Sharon has um, already said of what is planned to be an ongoing series of annual Sussex um, Humanities Lab lectures, and I am deeply honored to be here to start that ball rolling. When Caroline Bassett, thank you, hi, um, set up the lab with the help of Rachel Thompson and David Weir and David Berry and Sally Jane Norman and myself, it was conceived as part of a conversation between all the fields of the humanities and the social sciences and data science, informatics and computer science. Much of the discussion was about critique and analysis, how to bring that humanist perspective to the ever more central issue of the roles of technologies of the online and the digital in shaping cultural change. It was about exposing the sexist, racist, classist, and Eurocentric, and simply uninterrogated assumptions and prejudices lurking in code and system. This was and is a hugely powerful agenda central to the digital humanities more generally. And it has helped to shape the terms of discourse across a dozen disciplines. But the lab was also about something else. It was about using those same technologies, however flawed, to create humanist objects, art and history, games and narrative. It has always been about making, playing with the affordances created by each new technology, each new iteration and seeing what we could create. It has been about bringing different approaches and disciplines focused on sound, space, and text into new constellations about finding, for example, what corpus linguistics has to add to history and vice versa, and what music information retrieval can give to oral history and vice versa, just figuring out what happens when you throw together a bunch of Arduinos with a geographical information system and once made, making all of it available on the, um, to the widest possible audience on the web. It is, if you like, as much about critique. Uh, there is that element of critique. It was central, but it is also about making and just giving that stuff into the wider community. At its best, this making part of the lab's agenda is profoundly informed by critique and shaped by the same concerns and values. But it is a journey in dialogue rather than in lockstep. It is not simply a response. It is a conversation. In my mind, the genius of Caroline's inclusive vision for the lab was its desire to help critique, for, for, for critique to inform creation, and for creation to inform critique. And I knew then, and I know now, that my role in that 
was definitely on the making side of that equation. And what I want to do this afternoon is take you through my own journey from, critique, from creation to critique, if you like, or from critique to creation. I um, get a bit confused on that one, which I think is a good thing, by the way. And to draw a critical line between half a dozen separate projects that strike me as both about making new things and allowing me to see more clearly than I could before I started, where prejudice and race, sexism, Eurocentrism, and the simple unintended consequences of choices made in light of inherited data and unexplored technologies sit among all this stuff. And following that, I want to spend some time just reflecting on where we are in this weirdly new world of data and data science, of the humanities and the digital humanities, of history, digital history, archival and library science, just asking what the affordances of the minute look like and where the dangers of complacent adoption might lie. And finally, I want to speculate, and you'll, you'll have to sit through this, I'm sorry, um, for a moment on what we might create next. And as this is a retirement lecture, that, that seems like a, a good place to end. From the mid-1990s to around 2011, I and a number of people in this room, most especially Bob, had a small part in what I tend to think, tend to describe as the creation of the British Print Archive second edition. In less than two decades, pretty much everything published in English between 1500 and 1900 was digitized and made available on the web in one format or another. There was Ebo and Echo, and now just historic texts for books and pamphlets, and the Bernie collection for newspapers, and Google Books along the way. And added to this were parliamentary papers and Hansard, my own contribution my participation in the creation of the Old Bailey Online and London Lives, and more recently, the Digital Panopticon, all created with t a team at the universities of Sheffield, Hertfordshire, London, and Liverpool, added a few more bits and pieces, focused firmly on the non-elite and quotidian and the manuscript leavings of early modern administration. But one way or another, by the beginning of the last decade, that first tranche of print and a fair bit of manuscript, was available as data. During those same years, the British Museum and the Lewis Walpole Collection and a hundred other museums and galleries brought us prints and paintings, millions of them. And while many sought to turn this cultural heritage into just one more business opportunity, the institutions of memory, for the most part, made this material both findable and usable in new ways, as well as text, image became data. And of course, the New York Public Library and the British Library and half a dozen other collections brought us the joys of warped historical maps presented in Google Earth and available for reuse with any of a number of geographical information systems. In the process, the world of historic maps became data. And finally, museum collections came online in two dimensions and three, and artifact became data. And along the way, one system of ordering and locating a specific subset of human knowledge was replaced by another. Card catalogs, union catalogs, and accession lists were replaced first by OPACs, and then that all-seeing eye in reverse, that awful search box in the middle of a white screen located in its Californian Mordor, that yeah. Google search facility. There were and are silences and exclusions in many respects, we have simply re-inscribed on a global scale the canonization of Western culture and the denigration of a myriad other cultures and perspectives. The Western Archive's second edition is as racist, um, exclusionary, and flawed as the physical version it replaced, if not more so. And in this process, and if that process had been undertaken on the basis of well-conceived policy, rather than as a headlong rush towards low-hanging fruit, everything that was available in microfilm in 1988, um, it would have resulted in something very different. I'm the last person to defend the result, and at times I simply despair. I look back on some of the projects I was involved with and just ask myself why. But by the early 2010s, 
and along with pretty much every academic in the world, and I suspect every academic in this room, person in this room, I now access my object of study online via the internet. Indeed, by 2010 or so, I could describe my own object of study, 18th century London, as the most thoroughly digitized where and when in the world. I let my British library readers pass, lapse, and my pass to the London Metropolitan Archives. And I set out about then to play with the affordances created by the fact that all these different sources were now data. Having rushed, perhaps uncritically, into the new and the shiny, I was presented with something that could be explored and used to write history. And as a result, the challenge simply changed from seeking out rare detail from which to create new history. We were confronted with hyperabundance. As Dan Cohen asked in 2006, what do we do with a million books? Well, more than that, what do we do with a million images or half a million maps? In the process, it struck me that there was a subtle change in perspective. When you are searching for needles in haystacks, your focus tends to be on the needles, with the haystacks an irritating impediment simply to be sat on, if not ignored. But when you are staring at a warehouse of needles, you tend to ask, why did this get here? Why, why here and how did it get so big? In other words, for me, a fundamental transition occurred in that object of study. It was not simply putting together the small bits and pieces to rewrite an older story. It was suddenly a challenge to figure out what that thing looked like. And the transition point and the transitional technology from an ev old, even in 2010, was my first proper go at distant reading. Um, was distant reading. Having spent a decade or two just digitizing stuff, this was the starting point for my own journey down this particular rabbit hole towards a more careful consideration of the effect of methodology and digitization on the shape of culture. And so, with Bill Turkel and Dan Cohen and Stefan Sinclair and Bob, we, st we started with the Old Bailey Proceedings, 127 million words reflecting 197,000 trials heard over some 240 years. Arguably, and I have yet to find somebody who's willing to contradict me on this, the largest body of text recording the words and actions of everyday people ever produced. And patterns emerged. What had been an unknowable massive text object from which one sought to sift the odd needle became a story of change over time, reflecting dozens of policy decisions, the changing priorities of 200 Lord Mayors, and the gradual evolution of the criminal justice system. The resulting article took uh, five years to publish and was rejected by all the best journals. But writing it had a profound effect on how I thought about that object of study. It made me come to two separate conclusions. First, it made me doubt the continuities involved. Is a trial account from 1674 really the same thing as one from 1913? And how do you know? What are the characteristics that tie them together? It made me wonder about the relationship between evolving text forms and how they worked as evidence of a knowable past. If we use text to encode action in the past, how does that work? In other words, it made me question the way I had read evidence for 30 years up to that point. It undermined my sense of how I engaged with data of all kinds. The very category of trial was incoherent. How do we use them to construct history? It made me doubt, if, in other words. My practice is a largely text-centric historian. It's about that time when I started really doing woodwork seriously. <laughs> and second, it made me realize that over the preceding decade, I had lost the sense of context that came from reading a physical book in a physical library. Confronted with that scatter plot, I realized that I had come to rely on a simple search box in the middle of a white screen to deliver the answer I wanted without knowing how it came into being. So over the last decade or so, I've been trying to address those two conundrums. How do we read the text and images, maps and objects to find meaning? 
and how do we create systems of search that give the user a proper sense of context. In other words, I found myself moving both outwards towards the visualization of ever larger parts of the internet and inwards towards ever more, more precise understandings of what each individual word meant in its precise and narrow context. In 2013, I moved to the University of Sussex from the University of Hertfordshire and helped establish the lab the following year. And as part of this, I had the great good pleasure, good fortune, to begin an ongoing collaboration with Ben Jackson. And much of what comes next is a result of that collaboration, of our kind of weekly meetings over years where we really just spitballed ideas and he went and developed and implemented those ideas in a technical um, context. First, to very briefly outline that outward journey to scale. Starting with that, graph, that first graph in mind, we've been working on creating a series of macroscopes, systems for visualizing and exploring large collections of data. The first iteration, one of the first iterations of this involved the Discovery Catalog created at the National Archives in the UK. It includes some 32 million archival records from all the major repositories in the UK. And for the discovery catalog, we created an interactive scatter plot in which each dot, all 32 million of them, reflect both the number of words in each entry associated with each, um, each archival item along the y-axis, while the collection and archive information is recorded along the x-axis. At a glance, what this does is allow us to see just how the records of the British past are distributed both between archives and collections, and how they are, um, how much detail is used to describe them. Mapping record type and repository. It shows, for instance, that two thirds of the records of the National Archives are made up of military data. And that this material is thus fully cataloged than, for example, home office materials. We've also implemented the same kind of facility at the University of Sussex. And thank you to the University of Sussex Library for allowing us to do this. Um, we took the library catalog and did the same kind of thing. But because library and archival catalogs are so fundamentally different, we needed to take a slightly different approach. Our first discovery was, of course, that all major libraries are complex objects built over generations. And that for all the aspirations to universal consistency at the heart and core of every librarian's um, dreams, um, they are inconsistent. My favorite element of this graph is the small collection of inherited materials on education that remain cataloged in Dewey instead of the adapted Library of Congress system that is supposed to be used throughout. And of course, we've done the same thing for the Old Bailey, allowing dynamic filtering along the way by a fence, for example. Let's see if that, that, that works. In this, uh, for instance, and by punishment, and um, enabling anyone to drill down, facet, and select to categories of trial chosen by offense, gender, or verdict. This is distribution by gender, for example, and this by verdict. And finally, our most recent iteration involved the creation of a microscope for a new archive of oral history recordings of the staff of the BBC which is due to launch this summer. All right, looks like that. And the point at every stage was to force the user to acknowledge the context in which a particular object or text was held, to make explicit the systems that order inherited knowledge. I like to think of this, this part of the project, that this part of the project was driven by a critique of search and discovery an engagement with how that had come to work in the world. The simple acknowledgement that Google is both brilliant and crap at the same time. And as importantly, this is a long form project to de um, designed to demonstrate what is not there. By visualizing whole data sets, one's confronted by the shape of the warehouse, its dimensions and limits. It allows us to explicitly interrogate the process that brought it into being. It be makes the archive the object of study, if you like. The power of the archive and the library to silence and exclude is made manifest, or at least that was what was hoped. And these initiatives 
felt like they provided something like a broad context for texts defined by genre and form. But they did not do much to explain the words on the page, the journey, journey downwards, if you like. And for that, in the first instance, we sought to interrogate how we might contextualize words not in their genre, but in almost any other way. And the first one that came to hand was place, where they were created. And for that bit, we began with maps. Just after the work with Bill Turkel on the graph that started all this off for me, and in a very old school sort of way, I collected together around 600 references to the petition positions of beggars on the streets of 18th century London, drawn from literature, graphic images, administrative records, and Old Bailey trials, and simply mapped them against their claim location um, in the cityscape. And again, patterns emerged, and what initially felt like a coherent body um, object of study, beggars on the street, rapidly disintegrated into genre-dependent confections with an essentially unknowable relationship with the past. And from there, Bob Shoemaker, Sharon Howard, Peter Ruxlow, and a bunch of other people went on to try to create a more open mashup of text and space, which we called Locating London's Past. In itself, Locating London's Past is not particularly important, but it illustrates one naive attempt to play with text data and accessible online GIS, which was just then really becoming usable, and make something that facilitated mapping words to take the first step towards treating inherited material as data. So to be able to both look at it in its context, in the whole archival context, and where it sat on the street. But the outcome, locating London's past, did three things that struck me as interesting. First, it made available a fully rasterized and warped version of John Roke's 1746 map of London, which itself was beautiful. And the first accurate ordnance survey map of the capital created between 1869 and 1880, both of which had been fully polygonized and related to a modern Google Maps representation of London. And shockingly, in the process, what I discovered is that geographers and archaeologists actually believe that location is a knowable fact. Up until that time, I would not, I would have argued with that to the end of my days. And they beat me down and made me accept that um, this point on the earth, defined by latitude and longitude, was somehow real. And that helped me, in turn, overcome my own recent loss of faith in text as evidence. And second, it brings together around 40 million words of text and a raft of established data sets a few million lines of data into a newly geocoded form that can be mapped against both area and local population at the level of street, parish, and ward. And finally, it relates both these resources to the first comprehensive parish level population estimates for, eight, uh, for the 18th century. For me, it allowed words from inherited texts to be mapped against a comprehensive representation of the streets of 18th century London. So, and this is what, yeah. That's what the um, underlying pattern looks like, which I think is itself is rather beautiful. And that's what it looks like when you overlay it on a satellite image of... Um... So, and in the process, it makes each parish and street, ward and cul-de-sac, newly available as an analytical category, defined as a specific area and location, defined in terms of its distance from any other place, and the route between them, its size and importance in a hierarchy of streets, and defined securely against the Earth's surface. It allowed me to think about inherited words as located in a new single space. I can now take my 600 street beggars, or at least a subset of them, recorded in the records of the criminal justice system, and place them in the context of all the other texts about that particular street corner. This is the distribution of the mention of a horse, mare, or gelding, basically where all the horses and um, such were in 18th century London. And this is that compared to where all the beggars were. What the correlation actually means is um, not, not for this, this afternoon, um, at the very least, and probably not for me. But this, again, just left a further challenge. If we increasingly knew where words were created, 
or at least what location they were associated with, we did not yet have a sense of how that changed their meaning. And for that, we needed to go elsewhere, or else perhaps we needed to go back from whence we came, to the Old Bailey. And that's what Ben and I essentially did. In other words, having located the text in its widest compass, it seemed imperative to locate it within its narrowest context as well. If we were beginning to get distant reading right, it became ever more imper um, imperative to get close reading right. Of course, the 18th and 19th century Old Bailey courtroom vanished over 100 years ago, so that created a problem. But we had plenty of images and the original architectural plans for the court as it was rebuilt by George Dance in the 1770s. And what Dance created became the model for what would become a standard layout for British courtrooms, an exemplar that would later be translated and copied for use throughout the British Empire and beyond. Dance's courtroom formed one of the first of its sort designed to accommodate a specific kind of trial with specific spaces for each individual actor, judge, lawyers, jury, witness, and defendant. Up until this time, courtrooms tended to be large, open, and flexible spaces capable of being used for different types of trial and administration, a style of building um, the influence of which you can still see in US courtroom architecture, which is much flatter, much more open, um, and less, less theatrical. But from 1774 onwards, British courtrooms increasingly adopt, adopted a design geared towards a single drama of a jury trial. In the first instance, we focus on reconstructing the internal dynamics of a courtroom as designed by George Dance, since it was the model for all the others and witnessed the largest number of trials recorded in the proceedings. But then we had to locate the courtroom on the most detailed map we could find and in turn find its place in Google Earth and of course in locating London's past. If you ever get a chance to use the GOAD insurance maps, I would recommend them to anyone. They are, they are gorgeous. And before starting, out, starting to lay out the building on, on the basis of the surviving architectural plans, which look a bit like this. In the process, we also closely compared the model to contemporary images, primarily by Rawlinson, but really any image we could locate. And on the basis of these materials, Ben Jackson worked up the model. Resulting in something that looks like this. Which allows you to see from behind the defendant's um, perspective. In themselves, they're compelling. And we were really pleased with the result. The models were used as a basis for the set design for the last series of Poldark, if anybody's a fan. <laughs> And this is a photograph, by the way, of the set. And the thing that's most striking about it is how fake it looks. <laughs> and yet, it is absolutely accurate. Um, but they don't start, those models don't start to work as historical evidence until you begin to interrogate them more closely. The modeling revealed just how small and intimate that courtroom was, and how most depictions aggressively mislead us about the scale and grandeur. It also reinforced the sense of theatricality involved and allowed us to come to a couple of relatively secure conclusions. First, the modeling suggested that the design embedded specific assumptions about the relationship between different actors, defendant, witness, judge, and jury. And secondly, it reinforced the significance of the different levels Dance incorporated in his design. Lawyers were forced to speak upwards to the judge, jury, witnesses, and defendant from a cockpit several feet below the eye level of the rest of the room. Like a theater audience, the judge, jury, and defendant looked down on the stage below. But in this instance, there was no stage. In other words, what was created was a real feel of a theater in which, as a barrister, you were forced to perform to the gods. And judging by all the depictions we have of contemporary lawyers declaiming in court, to do so with all the gestures and conventions of the new theatricality of 18th and early 19th century theater. And along with Sharon Howard, we were then able to build on the work of Magnus Huber, who had marked up the text in the proceedings that purported to record spoken language. He said, she said, etc. And this allowed us to in turn map how this component of the trial process changed over time. In other words, we were able to both model the space and then analyze 
how that the, um, that the language worked within it. This is one of our first stabs at exploring the distribution of spe the speech in the proceedings. The yellow line reflects the percentage of trials in which speech is recorded at all, including a marked low in the 1780s and a marked decline from the 1830s and 40s. But the important thing is that we now have a direct physical context for every word and a sense of what it sounded like in a particular space. We have also applied a text-to-speech generator that allows you to listen to the dialogue and to visualize the interplay between different speakers. It is a little bit like um, having your history read out loud to you by Siri, but it, um, it, it works nonetheless. And this is what it looks like when you start um, visualizing all those trials as a conversation. And of course, you can also divide speech by gender and crime type and all of that. But the important thing is that when we now read a trial, we knew a lot more about both where it sat among 197,000 others. We were able at a single glance to say, where does it sit in this larger, um, larger archive? And how to read each individual word. My reading of this is that the design of the court created a new kind of trial as performance. And the 19th century then gradually evolved new ways of using that performance. And it all seemed an important step in thinking about how inherited data might be tied down more fully. It casts light on the selection process that creates the archive. The power of exclusion, if you like, um, on the one hand, and the power dynamics of performance on the other. What got through and what it meant. But that still left us with a problem. We didn't yet know how the words we inherited got there. And, the, and worrying that this suddenly made mapping of that journey from speech to text seem ever more important. So the first thing we did was try to analyze how the words in the court were recorded. From the early 18th century through the 1830s, this was done using a shorthand called brachigraphy, created and promoted by Thomas Gurney and his son Joseph, the two most important shorthand clerks at the Old Bailey during the 18th century. And the important thing is that unlike Pittman and most modern shorthands, which tend to encode sounds, brachigraphy was based on word shapes, meaning that it tends to hide accents and peculiar, the peculiarities of spoken language. And this is still very much a work in progress. And we've only recently identified the first example, and we've been looking for years, of brachigraphy as used to record an Old Bailey trial. And I'm still in the process of learning how to use it and figuring out what its use means in detail. But it helped put into focus that next technical transformation from speech to text and to draw greater attention to the printing process, to if you like that process that goes from a courtroom scene to the kind of thing that we've inherited. And here, we just wanted to get a much better feel of how words spoken in court became words on a page, became, if like, textual output, output from a printing press before they became data in the present. And while everyone involved, I suspect most people in this room, have done a little bit of letterpress printing, it seemed important to both think through how a common press worked the press that would have been used in the 18th century, and look at it from the ground up, including all the wood engineering involved, and relate that directly to the world of inherited data via CAD, via CAD. And so, as part of that, we built a CAD model of a um, common press, which when you um, add a few shadows, looks like that. And so, and with Patty Fumerton at the University of California at Santa Barbara, Ben Jackson and I started building a digital version of a common press, more as a way of getting to know the process than anything else. Ben, ben did all the hard work on, on this and pretty much everything else, if I was being completely honest. And this led us to co-teaching a course um, that was really fun at the, UC, at the University of California at Santa Barbara, doing so virtually. And it was going to result in building a full-size common press this year 
if COVID and life hadn't gotten in the way. But instead, what it allowed us to do was create a simplified model to get the students to then um, print it using a 3D printer, to assemble it, and to start using it to print things. Um, and just as a way of exploring the mechanics of printing, um, it became a rather wonderful um, experience. The influence of the technical process of taking speech and turning it into print became ever more evident. I like to think that what we all got from the process was a greater sense of the central role of the specific technologies, whether wooden or digital, in the creation of meaning from text. The ability to have like trace at each step that transition from a breath of air into something sitting on your computer screen. And for the narrow project of understanding words in place, this demonstrated that, in all likelihood, at least 70 to 80 percent of all words spoken in the Old Bailey never reached the printer, largely as a result of the economics of production and the balance between reader demand and the costs involved. We now know, for example, that the proceedings actively misrepresent both what was said and how it was said. There were types of words that are likely to be um, um, not recorded because of brachygraphy, if nothing else, selectively preserving the voices of some defendants and witnesses, perhaps determined by class and the violence of the offense. My suspicion, for example, is that you're much more likely to have your, your trial fully recorded if it was a violent offense rather than a offense of poverty and despair. By the way, don't tell Stephen Pinker that. It will ruin his argument. In the process, it appears, yeah, violence appears to have been rewarded while theft was glossed over. And by extension, we know that this kind of filtering is equally true of all recorded speech in 18th and 19th centuries, whether that is sermons, political speeches, depositions, Hansard, all of them are dependent upon a complex process of shorthand, of print, of selection, and recording. And until we actually take and model that and think about it in terms of that end product, we are going to be misled. We are going to be naive in how we use it. In terms of a wider project of critiquing the digital humanities and the humanities more generally, and data science, what this work seemed to imply to me is that the affordances of the digital um, demand a new precision about evidence, about that object of study. Whether that's a 16th century sonnet or a set of tree rings or an AI-generated picture or post-war French philosophy, having da traveled down this path from a global context to the specific context of a single word, the conceits at the heart of both the humanities and data science felt increasingly fragile to me. For the humanities, the belief that we can make arguments and tell stories on the basis of a reading of text for meaning without locating each word in its fullest context increasingly struck me as simply fallacious. While the conceit in data science, that if you have enough data, the signal will emerge despite the noise, increasingly strikes me as self-deluding. All of which gets me to the end of the beginning of this talk. What I think we've created is what I term radical contextualization, an ability to locate every word we have, both in its widest compass, amongst every word that has survived, and in the context of its moment of creation, to, if you like, reinscribe in detail the journey from mind to mouth, an ephemeral puff of air, to hand, from English to brachygraphy, to letter height lead, to marks on a page, to print, to survival, to digitization, to distant reading, to modern interpretation. With all of this in turn mapped on the world's surface, it is the beginning of what feels like a regularization of inherited data as a describable thing. What we had over the last 20 years is a remarkable journey in the creation of a new edition of all that stuff. And what is now required for us is to create the tools that allow us to deal with it, to work with it in new and more expansive ways. In some ways, I like to think of this project as moving in the same general direction as is evident in the gradual development of ever greater transparency in AI and machine learning and also in some parts of the digital humanities. Sorry, I forgot that one. That's what the press, uh, the press looked like. 
With machine learning, one might point to recent proposals to create standardized data sheets for data sets designed to record the motivation, composition, collection processes, recommendation use, and so on of every data set, which might be used to create a training set for machine learning. While model cards have recently been taken up by Google as a solution to the ever fresh accusation of bias in AI, uh, machine learning, and the application of neural networks. Between them, these initiatives seek to make transparent what goes into and comes out of the black box, makes both explicit and recordable the origins and biases of training data and the biases and characteristics of AI models created from them. And with the backing of Google, I suspect they will be adopted widely in the data sciences. And even in the more central corridors of that many-storied mansion that is the digital humanities, the same direction of travel can be observed in Alan Liu's recent WE1S project, What Everyone Says, which is developing new forms of data stories uh, or data narratives, published in the form of cards inspired by the documentation methods in medical and nutritional research. I like to think of my work as allied to these, but applied explicitly to the leavings of the properly dead. And along the way, I like to think that it contributes to the creation of what Donna Haraway has ter um, termed situated knowledges. But the point I want to end on is rather more speculative. And I guess gets back to my crisis of confidence in texts as a code for knowledge of a knowable past. Just as the decades before 2010 or so saw the creation of the Western Print Archive second edition, what is rapidly emerging are ever more secure ways of tying down data in the world. I have a whole other lecture on the significance and evolution of persistent identifiers, of PIDs, things like DOIs and IIIFs and ORCIDs, and their dozen of si dozens of siblings, all attempts to create a universal system that makes all data essentially findable. And the extent to which distributed ledger technologies, normally associated with Bitcoin and blockchain, are rapidly evolving to track cultural objects driven by a horrendous um, rentier capitalism. But the point I want to make today is that that new evolving system is creating a new environment and a new set of affordances, a new set of possibilities that will only will work well if we take seriously the need to identify the nature and origin, the journey of each of those elements of inherited um, evidence. But the thing about them is that it's rapidly become more possible to pull ever larger domain-specific data sets from the open seas of data available on the internet as linked open data, as new forms of search and natural language processing become ever more commonplace, the object of study has changed again, just as for me it changed around 2010. The demand for ever larger training data is at the core of current AI developments, and PIDs increasingly make possible rapidly and easily pulling together of ever larger domain-specific data sets. Every, every article ever published on the part of a body on hands or livers or whatever, or, a sing or ever published in a single location or about a single location or by people with the first name Louise. Similarly, in a, a range of humanist disciplines, these same PIDs make it ever more possible to build ever larger corpuses related to a specific topic. Suddenly, those warehouses of needles are newly siftable, findable, and manipulable in ways they never were before. And my point today is a simple one. If we don't take the time to understand each quantum of that data, if we don't provide information about its characteristics, then we'll be creating systems, conclusions and narratives that may have somehow work in the world just because of the scale of what we can build together, but would nevertheless flatter to deceive. What I believe is needed is a consistent format for labeling all data including its wild, widest context and its narrowest compass. And to make this happen, humanists need to work with data science, and data scientists need to work with humanists, and we both need a new infrastructure of findable data that is described in human, understandable ways. Caroline Bassett's conversation across disciplines 
the lab's purpose needs to take ever more concrete form and to be built into an infrastructure in which archival exclusions are recognized and archival content provided with a fuller context. It seems to me that it is only when a puff of air, a word, spoken in a long destroyed courtroom, can be traced from mind to mouth to shorthand to print to archive to microfilm to digital image and on to a textual simulcra that we will have taken the all-important step in tying down how we can use the leavings of the dead, all those billions of words, images, maps, and artifacts to evidence a knowable past. It's the first step in recovering history's first purpose, to explain the present. Thanks.